the royal family, figureheads to the nation, guardians of tradition, and the pride of the British people. But in the space of a single catastrophic year, everything changed. Shock, horror. In 1992, the royals were rocked by 12 months of toe-curling scandal. What is your exact relationship with the Duchess, Mr. Bryant? Three royal marriages publicly collapsed. A shocking book revealed suicide bids at Kensington Palace. I was astonished at the sheer desperation that she felt. And tapes were leaked of adulterous pillow talk. The heir to the throne saying, I want to be a tampon. I mean... This fairy tale family went from nuclear family to thermonuclear in a matter of months. This is the story of one disastrous year when modern Britain fell out of love with its royal family. It had become so absurd, it looked like that might be the end of the royal family. But also how one woman weathered the storm. The way things are going, one might have to consider a part-time job. Put her house in order. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis and finally emerged stronger than ever. But not before 12 months of shocks, scandal, and squidgy gate. This is the Queen's worst year. Nineteen ninety-two had a promising start for Elizabeth II. This was the year she was to celebrate four decades as queen. She had become one of the most admired monarchs in British history. Vital to her public appeal was her image, not just as a monarch, but as a mother, and the head of the most famous ideal family in the world. Family is everything to the Windsors and has always been, because if they are a tight unit that people can believe in, then it means that the monarchy can survive. For the head of the family, it had been 40 years of exemplary, scandal-free rule. The whole point of the Windsor dynasty is they're terrifically dull. Um, the point is you're not meant to envy their lifestyle, you're meant to think, oh, Scotland, cold, dogs, horses picnics, waving, and unfortunately, um, they started getting interesting. The first royal to make things interesting in 1992 was the family's newest recruit. Six years earlier, 500 million people had watched Prince Andrew marry his flame-haired fiancée, Sarah Ferguson. Duchess of York has struck a blow for the normal women of this country. But Fergie's popularity wasn't to last. Initially, everyone said, oh, isn't she marvellous? Breath of fresh air, you know, she sort of waves to people in the middle of the wedding service, you know, oh, this is what the royals need, you know, new blood. And then new blood comes along and people go, oh, God, she's ghastly. She was nicknamed the Duchess of Pork. She'd put on too much weight. She was a bit kind of a hooray and perhaps not that bright. There was a sort of crassness about the big Tesco's house that she had built in Windsor Great Park and a slight sort of money-grabbing edge to her. With Andrew often away on naval service, Fergie had indulged in an increasingly reckless private life. I think she started behaving as though she was a celebrity. And it's when the royal family and, essentially, soap stars um, become the same story, then um, you're in trouble. Can I have your pony? On the 18th of January, the 32-year-old Duchess was visiting a clinic in Florida for children affected by HIV. 
but all attention was turned elsewhere. In London, the press had broken the news of Fergie's close friendship with a Texan oil millionaire named Steve Wyatt. In Wyatt's luxury Knightsbridge flat, a cleaner had discovered a batch of holiday photographs. They showed the Duchess of York relaxing with Wyatt in the south of France. One showed Wyatt posing happily with the young Princess Beatrice. Fergie's photographed with Steve Wyatt, hugely compromising what she's doing with this man when she's married to Prince Andrew. The photographs were published in French magazine Paris Match. It soon turned out Fergie and Wyatt had been lovers for months. The Duchess was embarrassing herself and the royal family by parading around uh, London society with this guy, Steve Wyatt, a Texan, who referred to Fergie as Ma Woman. So they were like a couple, and the royal family were turning a blind eye to it. The Queen is notorious for what's called ostriching, for keeping her head in the sand and trying to ignore what was going on. But the Queen could ignore the crisis no longer. Her reputation in ruins, the Duchess of York's lawyers asked for a separation. The first crack in the model family was about to appear. On the 19th of March, Buckingham Palace announced that Andrew and Fergie were splitting up. I think the Queen was appalled that it had been the Duchess of York who had started separation proceedings. I think she felt that was incorrect, uh, it was against protocol, and if anyone was going to announce or signal the end of this marriage, it should be um, either the Duke, her son, or herself. The cautious queen didn't criticize Fergie in public. But palace hostility to the Duchess was about to be revealed. Royal Press Secretary Charles Anson gave a briefing to a BBC reporter. During that conversation, Charles went considerably further in dissing <laughs> the Duchess of York. Within hours, his comments were headline news. The Sun's headline was appalling. The Queen never said that. But, you know, the newspapers, it's all about selling on the headline. Who's not going to buy a newspaper if they see on the placard, Queen sticks knife in Fergie? But the damage had been done. There was a viciousness underneath the smiles and the waves that came from Buckingham Palace. There was a sense that, cross the royal family at your peril. Public faith in the royal ideal family was starting to slip. Yet the year was just beginning. Within weeks, a second royal marriage would fail and a shocking book would turn the Queen's worst year into meltdown. Nineteen ninety-two had started badly for Elizabeth II. Instead of her 40th anniversary, headlines had been dominated by the Duchess of York. But just five weeks after the York separation, the year suddenly got worse. On the 23rd of April, the 41-year-old Princess Anne arrived in Hampshire. She was opening a St John ambulance centre. But 50 miles away, in London, her 18-year marriage was ending in a five-minute quickie divorce. Back in 1973, Anne had married the dashing cavalry officer Mark Phillips. 
but by 1985, the romance was in trouble. Rumours started that Mark Phillips was being unfaithful, and then we learned that actually, not only had he been unfaithful, he'd fathered a child in New Zealand. In 1989, Anne herself became subject to rumour. Secret letters had been uncovered from Tim Lawrence, a former equerry to the Queen, uh, to Anne, um, and that they were in love. I thought, my goodness me. In 1990, Princess Anne had emphatically denied a divorce was on the cards. But speculation had continued to rage about Anne's private life. She's a very physical lady. The princess, I think it would be extraordinary if there wasn't another man in her life. And the one who has certainly been very supportive and has been constant to her in all this period has been the naval officer, Commander Tim Lawrence. Do you think that your friendship with Princess Anne... Is Despite the denials, the rumours proved true. In 1992, Anne became the first of the Queen's children to actually divorce. The failure of a second royal marriage shook public confidence in the Windsors. In a poll in May, nearly two-thirds said that the collapse of Anne and Andrew's marriages had damaged the image of the royal family. Anne's divorce had also raised a ghost from the royal past. In 1936, the Queen's uncle, Edward VIII, had announced his intention to marry Wallace Simpson, a twice-divorced woman. The scandal had forced his abdication. The Queen, of course, remembered very vividly her uncle Edward VIII's own relationship breakdowns. He wanted to marry Mrs Simpson, a divorcee, and it was either the throne or the woman. He went with the woman, but that had huge implications for the Queen and her family. She wanted to be the person who kept the royal family together. There is a terror of divorce, of dysfunctioning families in the royal family. The breakup of Princess Anne's marriage and the actual divorce suggested the floodgates could open. But if these two separations were serious, there was a third royal marriage that had been subject to rumour. All eyes now turned to the most famous royal couple of all. Eleven years earlier, Charles and Diana's wedding had given a massive boost to royal popularity and raised huge hopes for the future of the dynasty. Why, why are you so pleased? Because I think she's just the right person for him. But a decade into the marriage, royal watchers were wondering if the fairy tale was still on script. Earlier in 1992, Diana had given an ominous hint that all might not be well inside the world's most famous marriage. In February, she had visited the Taj Mahal, one of the most romantic buildings in the world. There, the princess had deliberately posed alone. She went and very pointedly took up a position with her back to us. Just this image of a wistful, wounded woman staring at this monument to love, alone, unloved. their curiosity inflamed, the public were desperate to know more about the true state of the marriage. They didn't have long to wait.
on the 7th of June, the Sunday Times began serialization of a book. In a year of disasters, it would do more damage than anything else to the royal ideal family. Diana, her true story, was the work of journalist and author Andrew Morton. He claimed the princess's friends had told him the shocking truth at the heart of the marriage. Diana had tried to commit suicide. She had thrown herself down the stairs when she was pregnant with uh, William. She'd tried to harm herself, she'd slashed her arms. According to the book, Diana had also hidden an acute eating disorder. Her bulimia was deeply shocking to people because she cut such a glamorous, sophisticated figure. And the visceral image, I think, of a princess doing that behind closed doors, I think, really shocked people. The book claimed that the cold royal family had ignored Diana's cries for help. And in the most explosive revelation of all, that Charles was still involved with an old girlfriend, Camilla Parker Bowles. In short, the fairy tale was an utter lie. It's so revelatory and it seems to contain such extraordinary claims. Initially, people are looking at it thinking, has this man gone mad? Is he making it all up? But Morton hadn't made it up. What's more, he had an explosive secret. The key source of the most damaging book in the history of the British monarchy wasn't one of Diana's friends. It was the Princess of Wales herself. A year earlier, in 1991, Diana had secretly asked Morton to write a book exposing her suffering to the world. I used an intermediary, a chap called Dr. James Colthurst. James was a mutual friend, he was also a doctor. He would go along to Kensington Palace on his three-speed push bike with a battered old tape recorder, and he would sit there in her sitting room, put the microphone on her, she would start talking away. And I was in a cafe in North London, and all around me, uh, guys in overalls were eating their bacon and eggs. And James appeared, and he had a, a, a tape recording of his conversation with Diana. And I put the headphones on, and I was transported into a, a parallel universe. The royal family were dysfunctional, they were cold, they were distant. She was living almost like a prisoner in the palace. I was astonished at the sheer desperation that she felt. Diana had deliberately broken one of the most sacred rules of the monarchy. The royal family had this sort of mafia-like code that you never stepped out of line or never spoke out against uh, one of the, uh, the family. You know, and so uh, uh, Diana had, uh, had betrayed that. Nobody in the royal family did that. They didn't go out. They didn't talk about their um, problems. They didn't talk directly to journalists. That was for film stars, people on telly, not the royal family. The day the Sunday Times serialization began, Prince Charles acted like nothing had happened and took part in a polo tournament. The Queen appeared to defy the book's claims by welcoming Camilla Parker Bowles into her royal enclosure. But this time, the traditional keep calm and carry on attitude wasn't going to work. It's difficult to convey the hysteria that gripped Britain in June 1992. People were fighting to get hold of copies. People were stealing them, running down the street. The publisher couldn't print copies fast enough to feed the public demand. Why are you interested in buying the book? Because I'm a royal watcher. I feel very sorry for her. With the book an instant number one bestseller, the royals were plunged into a full-blown national crisis. It was mayhem. It was the biggest cataclysm that had hit the royal family since the abdication. 
Newspaper editors were saying that my behaviour was disgraceful. Members of Parliament were calling for me to be sent to the Tower of London. This is a concerted conspiracy against the royal family in order to discredit them in the minds of the people. The motivation was to tell the truth. For once, forget the propaganda, tell the truth about what's really going on, because we do face a crisis in the House of Windsor. It's obvious to everyone. The opinion polls changed quite dramatically against the royal family. They became deeply unpopular. There was a lot of disrespect for them which is the one thing the Queen never imagined would happen during her reign. For the Queen, a year that had begun with embarrassment was turning into something much more serious. Incredibly, she seemed to be losing the support of her people. Inside Buckingham Palace, they talk about AM and PM, that is to say, before Morton and after Morton after Morton, the British public themselves woke up from this slumber of accepting the royal family as the leaders of society, as being the perfect family. Not only did people decide they preferred Diana to Charles in the battle, they preferred Diana to the Queen. They thought they've all ganged up on her. Here she is, the outcast, the victim, and the royal family became the baddies in a very simple story. And yet, public disrespect for the royal family was about to get even worse. Diana had tried to control the royal's public image. She had won her victory. But now, the gloves were off. The notion was that by cooperating with that book, Diana had invaded her own privacy. So the couple were then, from that point onwards, fair game. The public were now hungry for ever more personal royal revelations. Eager to oblige, the press would soon publish material of an intimacy that would stun the world. But this time, there would be no doubt about who was speaking. If you want to be like me, you've got to suffer. 1992 was about to get personal. By the summer of 1992, the royal family was looking less than ideal. Amid a wave of scandals, many Britons were losing their long-held faith in the Windsors. But surprisingly, there was one ray of sunshine for Her Majesty. Following an official separation in March, the Duke and Duchess of York appeared to have put their differences behind them. For a while, it looked as though the separation was only going to be temporary. Prince Andrew was staying at Sunning Hill Park, their country estate, with Sarah Ferguson. So it looked as though the marriage could possibly get back on track. But on the 20th of August, those hopes collapsed. The Daily Mirror published some of the most scandalous photographs ever printed of a member of the royal family. They showed the Duchess of York cavorting topless in the south of France with another American lover. What is your exact relationship with the Duchess of York? Could you tell me that, please? John Bryant was described as Fergie's financial advisor. Now, I've heard some euphemisms in my time, but financial advisor, that was a new one. Can you look this way? In the most notorious photograph of all, John Bryan appeared to be sucking the Duchess of York's toes. What the hell? Toe sucking? I've never heard of that. Is that a sexual thing? Have I been missing out on something? When I saw the photos for the first time, I thought, well, I'm not surprised. Because that was the nature of the individual. It was not a question of if, but when. Some believed the invasion of privacy had gone too far. Well, I think they're disgusting. I don't think that anyone should bother her. I think they should labour to live her own life. But while some sympathised, many more queued up to buy the mirror. We can't get one from anywhere. Really? Yeah. I mean, this is the third place. 
the British people are not prepared to put up with this sort of intrusion into personal privacy unless the gossip is really good. She's a member of the royal family, so I suppose it goes with the job. Should they have been published? Well, it brought out the fact that the marriage really was down the tubes, uh, that there was no marriage anymore, uh, and it was time to end the farce. And as a result of those pictures, the farce ended. On the day of publication, the delinquent Duchess happened to be staying at Balmoral with the royal family. I can only imagine what it was like. She came down and the papers were there, as they always are, spread out on the table. And there she is, in full frontal glory. Any comments, Miles? Fergie left Balmoral in disgrace. I don't think anybody was particularly sorry when she went, but she didn't go quietly and she hasn't been quiet ever since. Fergie's antics had further tarnished the royal reputation. In a poll three days after publication, eight out of ten Britons said she should be stripped of her title if she separated from Prince Andrew. Half said the reputation of the royal family was irreparably damaged. I think you're seeing with these photographs what had appeared to be this fairy tale family falling apart, and you go from you know, <laughs> nuclear family to thermonuclear in a matter of months. But the Queen's worst year was about to get even more explosive. Suddenly, the tabloids were in, a, in an arms race, really, you know, in a circulation war about who could print the most salacious, the most shocking thing uh, about uh, the royal family. And boy, did the royal family feed them that gossip. Just four days after the toe-sucking scandal, the Mirror's rival, The Sun, hit back. By printing the transcript of a late-night phone call between Princess Diana and a close male friend. James Gilby was a society bachelor and ex-car dealer. On the tape, he called the princess Darling 14 times and Squidgy 53. It was an absolutely excruciating sub Sloan love affair going on. Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely terrible at lunch. I mean, you know, she gave me a funny look. And, oh, no, did she squidge? Yeah, yeah, she did. I mean, hours of this stuff. Frankie said to me today, she said, I sat next to Nigel Haverdale, then all we could talk about was you. Diana complained of her misery inside the royal family. If you want to be like me, you've got to suffer. Squidgy. Yeah, you have to. And then you get what you... Get what you want. No, get what you deserve. She said, if you want to be like me, you've got to suffer. A telling insight into you know, how she felt about her marriage. And it was quite brutal what she was saying, particularly she said once, oh, bloody hell, after all I've done for this fucking family. I mean, she was angry. The conversation with Gilby had been recorded two years earlier, on New Year's Eve 1989 when Diana had been at Sandringham. It had been taped by an ex-bank manager and amateur radio enthusiast named Cyril Renan. He had apparently picked up the conversation by chance. This was going through the wavelengths, flicking through, and I just happened to hear the voice, which I recognise as Diana. Normally, I mean, the thing wouldn't have stayed on there many seconds, but for some unknown reason that night, that conversation stayed on. Renan had sold the tape to The Sun. They had sat on it for two years, but in the scandalous summer of 1992, they decided it was time to tell the world. As well as publishing the transcript, The Sun allowed readers to ring up and hear the actual recording for 36p per minute. This tape lasts seven and a half minutes from beginning to end. What are the press meant to do? I mean, you can't shoot the messenger. It was selling newspapers. You had a Charles Camp 
and a Diana camp. The nation's divided. Whose side are you on? That is perfect press fodder. And if people are buying into those stories, I'm sorry, all you can do in response to that is produce more and more stories. And of course, that's what Fleet Street did. Just 11 weeks after Squidgygate, the Mirror published extracts from another late night phone conversation. The man and woman weren't named, but the article, labelled Camilla Confidential, left readers in no doubt that the speakers were the heir to the throne and his mistress. Now we had incontrovertible proof that uh, Charles was an adulterer. Nine weeks later, the world got to read the full transcript in all its shocking glory. In the most notorious passage, Charles imagines being reincarnated as Camilla's tampon. Running a satirical publication, can you imagine? You've got to deal with Squidgy Gate and then Camilla Gate, the heir to the throne, saying, I want to be a tampon. I mean, pretty hard to come up with something more damaging to a public figure. Really, you just can't believe what you're hearing. It's one of those things where you literally cannot believe that you're hearing this from the mouth of the heir to the throne. There was a poll around that time that showed that almost half the British people felt that Charles should not be king. By the autumn of 1992, the royal family had gone from national institution to national joke. Well, what about this tape? Yes. It's an answer machine. Rubbish. I distinctly heard him say, I love you, Squatty. Comedians gleefully mocked the woeful Windsors. Above all, in the satirical TV show, Spitting Image. We'd get, you know, eight or ten million viewers some Sunday nights, and the stars of our show were the royal family. Are you looking for work? Oh, well, um, the way things are going, one might have to consider a part-time job. And, and I... Sometimes we ask ourselves, is there anything that's too unfair or too embarrassing? And the answer was, every time we thought that, they'd go and say something more embarrassing in public or there'd be more embarrassing photos in the papers. So they were... They were out satirising themselves that year. And you join us today for that most glorious and traditional royal occasion steeped in history, the changing of the wives. But behind the laughter, the message for the Windsors was deadly serious. What changed with the royals was the notion of blind respect. The royal family were no longer this um, perfect model of behaviour for all of us. So to have these very wealthy people living this high life but actually behaving very poorly, I think people just got fed up with it. And when that all blew up in 92, I think people were ready to say enough is enough. The Queen's worst year had entered new and dangerous territory. She'd seen the whole family pull down into the gutter. So for her, it was as though all this work since she became queen in 53 was for nothing. And that here was this, this institution uh, barreling down the road and the road was to nowhere. The British people began to wonder whether these scandals could be not just embarrassing for the royal family, but fatal. After Morton and Squidgegate and then Camillagate, I think there was a sense that we were in previously uncharted waters, as far as the royal family were concerned. In August, even the staunchly conservative Daily Telegraph called the royal family largely a sentimental Victorian concept. While two-thirds of callers to a Sun newspaper poll agreed Britain no longer needed a monarchy. Public opinion was running at a level which made it dangerous for the royal family. Once the being fed up with the way the younger royals behave turned into, I'm fed up with the queen, it's all her fault, they're awful anyway. Once it sort of spread up the generations, there was a feeling of, well, maybe it's, maybe it's time, maybe it's all over. Then, just as the crisis reached its height, 
smoke was seen billowing from Windsor Castle. After a summer fighting personal fires, the royals now watched their own home go up in flames. They were about to face their darkest hour. Unbelievably, 1992 was about to get even worse. By winter 1992, the Queen was looking back on the most damaging 12 months of her 40-year reign. But the Queen's worst year was to have one more twist for Her Majesty. I was at Buckingham Palace on the 20th of November in my office and um, I got a phone call from BBC Radio Berkshire. There's a fire at Windsor Castle. Can you confirm it? And I said, I'll get back to you. My pager went off. We wore pages in those. And it said, Windsor Castle is on fire. On the 20th of November, just nine days after Camilla Gate, the world's largest inhabited castle went up in flames. The fire had been caused by a spotlight igniting a curtain in a private chapel. If you were a Hollywood screenwriter writing the story of the royal family this year, and you put, and then the royal castle burned down, the, the director would go, this is too corny, you know, you've got enough there. There was a human chain getting all the treasures out, passing carpets, great carpets being passed out and the feeling that they were not going to be able to control it. It was heading towards the library, so they started removing stuff. Fortunately, I was able to get the Duke of York up in front of the cameras to talk about what was going on. Shock, horror, um, and shock and horror in the fact that it took hold so quickly. But if Andrew was facing the cameras, all attention and sympathy was turned on someone else. Uh, her Majesty was shocked. As a girl during the Second World War, Windsor had been the place the Queen called home. The fire now raged for over 15 hours. It took over a million gallons of water to quench the blaze. The morning after the fire, it was wet, it was cold, and the Queen came to visit. And all of a sudden, she sneezed, and her head went forward, and she was kind of bowed over, and I was watching her, I wasn't far away from her, and at that moment, she seemed unguarded, and you just saw a woman who'd had everything thrown at her through the year. Divorces, disasters, humiliation, and now her home on fire. I felt very sorry for her. Yet sympathy for the Queen was not to last. With the fire still smouldering, the government announced that the nation would foot the repair bill, estimated at £60 million. Pounds. Oh, so we pay. Government don't pay, we pay. Everyone's going, no way, we're not paying for all of that. You've got all this money, you've had all this scandal. In a time of bitter national recession, the younger royals were already seen by many as wastrels and sponges, while the Queen was attacked for her exemption from income tax. For many of her subjects, the public repair bill for Windsor Castle was the final straw. So much had changed in the months before the Windsor fire, which had changed people's opinion about monarchy, and it had been horribly exposed. I mean, you look actually at the shell of Windsor Castle, and it was almost a symbol for the family itself, wide open, destroyed, in tatters. This was the first time I can remember the, the Queen losing public sympathy. Um, and that hadn't happened before, or not in my time. Four days after the fire, Elizabeth II attended a lunch at London's Guildhall. Her popularity slipping away, the Queen finally realised she had to speak. 
1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. The phrase meant terrible year. It was the opening of the most honest and revealing speech Elizabeth II had ever given. There can be no doubt, of course, that criticism is good for people and institutions that are part of public life. No institution, city, monarchy, whatever, should expect to be free from the scrutiny of those who give it their loyalty and support. This was her putting up her hands and saying, we have made huge mistakes here. It's right that you're scrutinising us because it hasn't been perfect. In fact, it's been far from perfect. But we are all part of the same fabric of our national society. And that scrutiny by one part of another can be just as effective if it is made with a touch of gentleness, good humour and understanding. She was making the point, by all means, have a go at us. Have a go at us as a family. If we've done it wrong, tell us. But don't be vicious about it. And, and one short line was the most important of all. This sort of questioning can also act, and it should do so, as an effective engine for change. I think her coming out to the public, admitting that the royal family were human, admitting that it had been a terrible year, and that the public were entitled to have opinions about the way the royal family was run, for the Queen in particular, um, it was fairly extraordinary. And I think that was the moment when um, the royal family realised that uh, the way forward would have to be different. Just 48 hours after the Annus Horribilis speech, the Prime Minister told Parliament that the Queen and Prince Charles had volunteered to pay income tax. Soon after, it was announced that Buckingham Palace would be opened for the first time to the public to help pay the costs of the Windsor repairs. There's no doubt that 1992 forced the Queen and her advisers into a new way of thinking. They had to modernise. 1992 had been the most agonising year of the Queen's reign. The model royal family was over. But there had been a surprising silver lining. If the royals were no longer perfect, they were perhaps a little more in tune with the modern age. We're human. We too have problems. We too can get it wrong. The transformation didn't happen overnight and there were more controversies ahead for the slowly modernising monarchy. But the scandals of the Annus Horribilis had started a process of change. We've seen subsequently the Windsors treat royal wives a lot differently and a lot more compassionately if you look at, say, Prince Edward's wife, Sophie Wessex, or indeed Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge, having been welcomed with much more open arms now. And incredible though it would have seemed at the time, by surviving the storm, the Queen might just have made the royal family stronger. We can see the legacy of 1992 now. I mean, the reason she's the longest serving monarch ever in the history of the universe, everyone desperately hopes she'll live forever and um, um, be queen for good. You can date back to that period when the royal family thought, we have blown it. Now, as she reaches her 90th birthday, the Queen won't look back on 1992 with any pleasure. But she may look back with a hint of pride. Scandal almost destroyed her family, but they rose from the ashes, and the Queen survived her worst year and lived to see some of her best. <laughs>